Uh, in the meantime, hey guys, it's really good to be back. We're going to be talking about a lot of AI stuff that we saw down at CES. We actually only did a handful of LTTs. We did some of those sponsored ones before the show. Um, we've got a couple of ones that I'm really, really happy with. The one from the Intel booth today. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. It's awesome. Uh, it talks a little bit about Thunderbolt 5, um, a little bit about this cool new feature called Thunderbolt Share. Uh, the title for that video is... 100% not clickbait. Um, that whole room was under NDA until I went in, checked it out, and I was like, please, can we talk about this? And there was a process, and they pretty much got the business unit head in the room with me a couple days later, and I kind of made my case. I kind of went, look, I have this idea in my head for a piece that I want to do on connectivity uh, because frankly what am I supposed to do talk about Meteor Lake <laughs> so let's talk about moving data around really fast which is something that Intel is really flipping good at what I want to talk about is Thunderbolt 5 I want to talk about Wi-Fi 7 which is it anyone else is, is anyone else's jaw on the floor over how, how Wi-Fi 7 snuck up on us Wi-Fi in general seems to be moving very fast. Wi-Fi 7 came <laughs> out of, it feels like, absolutely nowhere. My first real, like, oh, I am very interested in this technology happened when I was on set holding a Wi-Fi 7 access point and a Wi-Fi 7 device, watching them transfer speeds at it, speeds in excess of 2, 3 gigabit per second. I'm sitting here going... What the heck? Are you freaking kidding me? A, wi a, a Wi-Fi upgrade that actually upholds the promises it makes about next-gen performance? This is incredible. Uh, so I made my case. Look, I want to talk about moving data around really fast, and I feel like Thunderbolt Share is really critical, but I need you guys to answer some deeper questions, because the first time I was in there, even when I wasn't going to be making a video about it yet, I was like, okay, but like, how? What's the data path? And they're like, we can't tell you any of that. Um, I still had to do a little bit of educated guesswork, so it's early days, as all of the software's in alpha, it's super cool, go watch the video. Uh, but the other really big one that I'm super proud of is we did a video on kind of the, the evolving situation around uh, connectors on the back motherboard. So ASUS BTF, uh, MSI Project Stealth, I think they call it, and then Gigabyte Project Zero, no, Project Zero. I can't remember, I think Gigabyte's Project Stealth, MSI's Project Zero. Um, and then there's now an ecosystem that's developing for these products. Corsair has two cases that natively support these rear connector motherboards. And we kind of fleshed it out into a full LTT by tearing down the demo PC in Corsair's booth and then rebuilding it as the video. Kind of talking about there's one key thing I missed, and I feel stupid for not mentioning it in the video now, but um, how there will be some challenges moving this to 100% adoption, no matter how good it is, no matter how many industry partners support it, and that's that it adds a bunch of clearance on the back of the motherboard, especially with stiff connectors like front USB 3, uh, especially front USB 3 type C. Um, that just isn't there on budget cases that, that want to be as, as narrow as possible in order to save on materials. So that's, that's something I didn't cover. But other than that, it's, it's pretty thorough. That one's going to be really good. And then the other kind of big production that I did on the floor, like not a short circuit, like a full LTT, was a roundup of, I think we ended up hitting about 10 AI booths. And I'm talking AI duct taped to a bicycle, AI duct taped to a computer mouse. Uh, like what's AI integrated into a monitor? What, what would an AI monitor be, Luke? I challenge you to tell me because he, he wasn't at the show this year. So <laughs> no. this is all going to be fresh for him because it's not like he you know pays attention to tech news or anything. Not He's got really. the WAN show for that. Yeah, I saw the <laughs> rabbit. Um and I do want to talk about that. Yes, we'll definitely talk about uh, the rabbit. But it, 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 I don't know. Like picture picture quality profile settings changing dynamically with content? Yeah, I know. You're not even close. So we'll talk about that in a bit. All right. Yeah, let's jump right into CES. Um, okay, we'll talk about AI things. Let's, let's talk about the rabbit R1. Yeah. This ended up being a surprise hit. And uh, I've, I've got to say, I am still surprised. <laughs> uh, their video has 3.7 million views up in here. Uh, what? No, st 
stop. I don't. Not. What do you stop? Not right now. Comments uh, turned off. Three day old video. Seven point four four thousand subscribers. Three point yeah. seven million. Three point seven million views. Uh, this launched as a uh, it was as a Kickstarter, is that right, or as some kind of as some kind of crowdfunded device? I can't remember. Mm. No, I don't think it did. I don't nope. think so. No, it didn't. I think it just launched for sale. Basically, it's a two hundred dollar palm sized device co co designed with Teenage Engineering that sold out its first batch of ten thousand units in just. 24 hours and the second batch sold out a day later and i would forgive you for asking i'm sorry what is it exactly it is part of this is from our notes an emerging class of devices that are essentially dedicated hardware for ai assistance so the first example that we've talked about on the show of this which is the humane ai pin is 700 dollars and seems to be um not especially functional. Um, so that's the one that has the little projector so that you can uh, see a sort of virtual screen on your palm. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. Does anyone have one yet? The humane pin? Yeah. Not that I'm I aware of. I don't think so, right? Yeah. So uh, we'll... There's another one called the tab <coughs> that I have to confess I have I never, never heard, heard of, of and yeah. I wouldn't have clicked on this headline. That is a, that is a stupid headline. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, to replace this? God? Superpower Tamagotchi. Also, what is up with these ads? <laughs> I can't even see anything. Uh, cool. Anywho, uh, thanks, Fast Company. Um, and then, of course, there's the Rabbit. So the R1 runs Rabbit OS and doesn't have apps. Instead, it's large action model. So yeah. kind of like large language model. In this case, it's it's a model of, of actions. Uses computer applications like a human does. So the product demo showcases common use cases, like ordering food, but in theory, you can manually train it to do any task by explaining what you're doing as you record your computer screen. That's actually pretty interesting. So theoretically, if you show it how to um, buy Tide Pods because you're a hungry millennial, <laughs> then it would be able to open a web browser navigate to you know amazon or whatever website is good to get oh everyone's pointing out you saw ads i don't know what they were for that's pretty good i, I know and something I think you was in my way saw them because you literally yeah you literally could not see the thing you needed to see if you gave me if you told me i could have a million dollars if i could tell you what those ads were for <laughs> i would have to give up the million dollars <laughs> i have absolutely no idea <laughs> right. um that's pretty good okay I do occasionally see them, but in this case, honestly, I don't know what they you couldn't were for. see the content. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, okay, what are we supposed to be talking about right now? Uh, right, right, right. So you could you could show it how to how to kind of navigate through the cart through the checkout process and place an order for you, which um, raises some concerns for me. I mean, <laughs> giving a device sort of that will hopefully do exactly what I want it to do, this kind of access to money. to logged in applications and services to, 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 to take actions on my behalf definitely gives me a little bit of unease. Um, but assuming that it actually works as well as it should, I mean, it's basically auto hotkey, but with AI, if you kind of think about it, which raises a question like, oh, why not just make this an app? Founder Jesse Liu explains that A, because you get more clout this way. It's true. And B, it's not wrong. <laughs> because o opening a phone app to make it do things on other apps that you have installed seems kind of awkward. Uh, Riley says, <laughs> look, Ri hey, Riley added something to the doc. Uh, Riley does help with the doc. I just mean he's got a little commentary thing here. Uh, yeah. I appreciate the vision of a device that changes what it looks like to do computer phone stuff instead of hunching over a screen, tapping little buttons while ignoring people around you. Uh, you just tell your little Tamagotchi Pokédex to do something, and it does it. It totally could have been an app, um, but maybe it shouldn't be an app, says Riley, and you can't deny the cool design. The last line from Riley is a huge part of it for me. Teenage engineering was a part of this, therefore... This killed. <laughs> I think that's where a lot of this lands. It looks really cool. It looks super cool. 
And I think in an era of the most boring rectangles we've ever had, um, with as much touchscreen things as possible, having physical stuff, push to talk mic, flip the camera around thingy, physical device. It's an actual thing that I can have. I think a lot of people are gravitating towards that. D-Brand apparently has a skin coming. <laughs> because of course they do. Um, on that note... Yeah. Another example of that that was from our AI roundup video that I walked into thinking was stupid and walked out of very close to wanting one was this uh, AI voice recorder. So what it does is it just transcribes voice to text and then at the end it or it tra then it transfers sorry first it records audio then it transfers the audio to your phone it transcribes it voice to text style, then it creates uh, like a, like an index of the main topics, whether it was a meeting or a phone call or a job interview or whatever it was and stores it, which is like, okay, don't you have Otter or some other, some other, you know, uh, large language model assisted uh, voice recognition and transcription software for your phone? Don't, don't you, isn't there an app for that? But bear with me here. I kind of went, okay, why does this need to exist? And they said, well, a number of reasons. First of all, the iPhone does not support call recording. Why call recording is not supported on the iPhone is, I don't know, because f you, I guess, you know, Apple things or something. I, I, I don't know, but it's not. And one of the modes that it operates in is specifically designed to tune the microphones for recording calls. So having it sitting on the back of your phone, it, it goes on with uh, MagSafe. Having it sitting on the back of your phone means you can be on a call. You just hold a button until it buzzes. You are now recording the call. So in many places, so to those of you freaking out about this, in many places, it is legal with single party consent. So just your own consent to record a call, uh, including here. And there have been... I gotta say, numerous times in my life when having a recording of a phone conversation would have been extremely helpful, either because the other party didn't remember, because the other party misrepresented it, or because I didn't remember what took place on the call and what everyone had agreed to. It would have been great to be able to go back in time and go, okay, what did actually, what did actually happen? Where Absolutely. did this miscommunication happen? I'm sure we've all been in that spot before. You hold it for longer, it buzzes twice, and the call recording ends. Uh, it, it'll do, I think it was 30 hours is rate, rated. So who knows, but it's rated for 30 hours of continuous recording. And it's like this thin. It's like, it's, it's crazy thin. It just kind of sits on the back of your phone and you can put it in like a little wallet Does it sleeve. like share power with the phone or something? Uh, no, no, no. It just has a little tiny, little tiny battery in it. And it uses pogo pins to, to charge but just with a standard USB connector. Um, and then there was, yeah, and I kind of, I kind of came away from it going, yeah, so now I have the ability to not drain my phone's battery with an additional app. I don't have to fumble with an app on my phone. I can record calls on a phone that doesn't out of the box support call recording. And if my phone is dead outright, I can still record stuff, copy the audio files onto my computer or sync them with my phone later. And, and I've, and I've got it. I can still record a meeting or whatever the case may be. And you know what? It's the kind of thing where not everyone's going to need that, but people who do need it, just having it, that's freaking awesome. So I, I, so yeah, I, I walked in going, well, this is silly. This could just be an app. And I walked out going, yeah, the app is like the, that's like the crappy version of this, you know? And those guys, that's where, that's where I got my wires crossed. Those guys just raised like millions of dollars on Kickstarter. So that, yeah, that's, that's where I got. So interesting. Right. So we're all going to external devices. I know, right? What Every, the heck? Everything was going into the phone. And now we're bringing back the talk boy. 2024 is the start <laughs> of things coming out of the phone. I, I mean, I guess. I think most people are still going to use the consolidated device, but I mean, do you know how many people I saw walking around the show with point and click cameras? Really? Yeah. And I don't even necessarily mean obvious media, you know, who are holding a, you know, a little mirrorless or something, sure, you know, yeah. and a, and a, and a, you know, a shotgun mic with a dead cat on it or whatever. I'm, I'm talking people just, you know, taking pictures and it's actually very nice not being on your phone all the time, even if you're doing things that you would normally do with your phone. 100%. Because, like, you're taking pictures, you're sitting there, but notifications are popping in. 
whatever else is happening. You're draining your phone's battery. You're doing all this kind of stuff. It's like, ugh. Uh, I definitely have some concerns about privacy with devices like this. The uh, the recorder is powered by ChatGPT. Ah, cool. So, yep. Hopefully, if you're using one of these, you don't work at a three letter agency. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, honestly that's a big thing with. Um, I mean, it's been been a big thing with LLMs this whole time, but with both the Rabbit and this, uh, and and I mean theoretically the AI pin and the tab or whatever as well, but. Like, okay, so I can record actions. Uh, what if I start doing my timesheet with Rabbit? Yeah. That's some external device accessing company documentation and put inputting something that's like a legal process to a certain degree. Th that affects compensation. Yeah. That is like directly... It's actually a huge deal. Money. Yeah. Because you would totally do that. <laughs> Look, look at the look on his face. 100%. He's not even going to pretend but to deny the, it. But on the security side, it's like actually too big of a deal. I would love to do that. Yeah. But like, I... No. No. It's like there's a lot of different Chrome extensions that can help you with like email, that can help you with all this other kind of stuff. And then you look through what you have to share with the Chrome extension. It's like... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary. Maybe I better maybe, just learn to type faster. Maybe no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think a big one that we should talk about is the bike with ChatGPT. Did you see that headline as well? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? That was the product that inspired what? the the <clears throat> sort of roundup of silly AI integrated products at CES. And believe it or not, when I walked out of the booth, I wanted one. <laughs> Not because I would actually use it. I'm not actually going to buy one. Man, you getting sold on things at CES that aren't monitors or computers is actually weird. I got sold on this thing hard. It's a bike. It, well, it's an e-bike. Okay. With 200 kilometer range. Wow. Yeah. So this thing, you could like commute Whoa. from the burbs yeah. on it. Yeah. Like incredible range. Huh. Okay. And... It's not just a bike with chat GPT bolted to it. It's a bike with an API that can interface with other products that have APIs. And it's not some like vaporware nonsense thing. This is their second generation and the product fundamentally already exists and is already being used in useful ways. So... Actually, speaking of ways, uh, one of the integrations that they have is with, I forget what it's called, but this mapping software that's really popular in Europe for cyclists. Okay. Because um, apparently Google Maps for, for cycling is just, just trash in Europe, and there's this other one that uh, everyone uses or something like that. And so Buddy at the booth basically goes, yeah, so right now we support chat, chat GPT 3.5, I think is, is what they're on right now. So you basically just press, you hold this button, and you say... Um, I am, I'm in city. Is, is this it? No. Oh. Wait, yes. That looks a lot like the display. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. But no, the models were different. That's why I got confused. Because oh. the models are not cord. They're, they're something else. Okay. I'll um, keep trying yeah, so they're, they're new products. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's the company though. And so, so basically the demo is, okay, um, Chat G, I'm, Chat I'm, I'm looking for somewhere to eat, uh, plot a course to here. And through the API access to ChatGPT, it can handle the like language interpretation and, and voice to text. And then through the API integration with this mapping app, it can set a course. And through API integration with Apple Health, it can monitor your heart rate off of your Apple Watch and dynamically adjust the motors to help maintain oh, your flipping that's heart pretty rate cool. as you're going up and down random terrain. So you terrain. Can, like stay zone two the whole time. And I'm sitting That's there, actually sick. I I'm looking at this thing going, so this is basically, oh, it has all cool. the, right? It has all the control of a stupid stationary Peloton stupid thing in your living room, but all the actually being f***ing outside and, and of a bicycle. If you're commuting somewhere, or going to get groceries or whatever else, you're like actually doing something. And all the, and all the range of a freaking, you know, <laughs> moped. This is, this is something I've been interested in with like, all of what? these, with all of these devices, but someone in, someone in Philippine chat, Dofo just said, imagine how it'll hallucinate. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, I can't do that. Dave. His heart rate is really low. <laughs> Make it work. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, what's cool about it is just that it has an onboard. It's essentially, it's a, it's a smart bike. You know, two years yeah. ago, it would have been called Smart, smart Bike. bike. Yeah. And three or four years ago, it would have been called 5G Bike of the Future. I do wonder, like... And, and <clears throat> seven years ago, eight years ago, it would have been called IoT Bike. Yeah. You know, so to an extent... It's just a new name for fundamentally the same idea, the same which stuff. is which is a global connectivity, right, between all of our devices and, and the services that we use. But the AI, the chat GPT element of it is kind of what ties it together, because realistically, biking is not exactly a, uh, a hands free use yeah. case. Yeah. So being able to use my voice. Kind of important. So that, that, that's what I was going to kind of ask is. Yeah. Is, I've been wondering how a lot of these devices are going to beat beat the hallucinations. And I'm kind of wondering if this one might be beating it by actually limiting how much the ChatGPT side of this is actually even doing. Because, like, if it's if it's changing how much the motor is helping you based on your heart rate, mm -hmm. ChatGPT doesn't even need to be involved with that at no, all. it wouldn't be. At no point. That's a completely separate, the like, ways API integration, integration thing. Uh, probably all it's doing is using its voice input, if anything. Um, like a, a lot of the it's, different it's not things, ways. it's, it's some other one, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Whatever mapping integration they have. Um, it, it's very likely it's not even using ChatGPT to do anything with that. Um, so what is it, what is it actually using ChatGPT for? For uh, voice to text. That's essentially. It? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As far as I can tell, you can also just like ask it questions and interact with it if you want to. Right. Right. Like you can cycle so you could through use, like, different standard. Yeah. Yep, and I mean, I'll, people are raising all kinds of great questions. Okay, right, Linus, but what happens when they brick this thing? Then you have an e-bike with 200 kilometer range. <laughs> hopefully. I mean, yeah, um, or, or hopefully they open it up or, or you know, something. Uh, and like, Linus, would you really want, you know, some network to have your freaking heart rate and, and where you are and, every, and every, all the food you ate? And No. But a lot of people won't care. Yeah. And for them, cool bike, bro. You're already giving a lot of that information in a lot of these situations. Which doesn't make it right, doesn't no. make it good, but... Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but it makes it it. <laughs> it's, it's kind of is what it is. Um, got another question 